So far in this series, things have stayed pretty simple. I've been able to talk chronologically about my gaming experiences, starting with the Apple II, then the years of the Commodore 64, and on into the heyday of the NES. But in the summer of 1989, the video game console market in America suddenly got a lot more crowded, with the US releases just weeks apart of two considerably more powerful consoles, the Sega Genesis and the TurboGrafx-16. I didn't really have much experience with Turbo stuff until the Turbo Duo came out in the 90s. And even then, I was the only person I ever knew who owned one. So I'll save that story for later. But after its launch, the Sega Genesis made slow and steady strides in the market, gradually chipping away at the complete monopoly Nintendo had been enjoying for years. But it wasn't until Sega introduced a memorable mascot in Sonic the Hedgehog and started touting blast processing that the console wars really began. Now, best as I can remember, the first time I saw a Sega Genesis was at my friend Wayne's house. He'd rented one from a local video store, probably Polar Bears. You may remember in the first of these videos, I talked about an ice cream parlor in town named Polar Bear Ashburns that had a great arcade I enjoyed as a kid. Well, by the late 80s, they'd converted the area that had been their arcade into a video rental store. So Wayne had rented a Genesis, and when I came to his house that day, I found him playing Fantasy Star 2. I'd never seen or heard anything like it. The music and graphics blew me away. And not only that, just the game itself impressed me because I'd never really seen an RPG in a futuristic setting. For a while after that, my only experiences with the Genesis were times when I spent the night with a friend and we rented one from a video store. In particular, during those early days of the Genesis, I can remember renting Altered Beast, Ghouls and Ghosts, Golden Axe, Columns, Fantasy Star 2, and Herzog's Vi. I remember one particular week I was homesick from school with asthma and I played all the way through a rented copy of Fantasy Star 2. The graphics and sound on the Genesis have a very solid feeling, arcade-like quality. I can't really think of another way to describe it, but I think the same Yamaha audio chipset was used in a lot of arcade hardware. Particularly in the graphics department, the Genesis blew the NES away. And remember, the NES is all we had to compare it to when it came out. I think this is something a lot of younger gamers don't realize. They see the Genesis as a competitor to the Super Nintendo, which was eventually true, but the Genesis came out over two years before the Super Nintendo was released stateside. Two years with essentially only the NES to compete with makes it sound like the Genesis would have taken over the market easily. But you gotta remember that the video game market wasn't like it is today. We weren't used to upgrading every few years. That had never happened before. When the SNES came out, local news stations ran stories about parents being outraged that it wouldn't play NES games and calling it a ripoff. Everybody had an NES, and most people were content with that. Well, at least parents were. Plus, the Sega Master System had been released here, and it did very poorly, so Sega didn't have the best reputation outside of the arcades. Eventually, and I don't really remember exactly when, but I know I was driving, so it was at least the summer of 91. Polar Bears went out of business. Actually, that's not fair. Their business was doing great, but the owners were getting older and just decided to retire and sell off all their rental consoles and games at super low prices. When I saw this was happening, I rushed home and gave my parents a passionate speech about how this was a once in a lifetime opportunity and could they please, please loan me some money to buy a Genesis and some games. They bought it. So I hurried back to Polar Bears and bought a rental Genesis and some games. I can't remember exactly what I bought, but I know I at least got Fantasy Star 2, 3, and Columns. Probably Altered Beast and Sonic the Hedgehog as well. Now, when I bought the Genesis, they gave it to me in its rental bag. This is it right here. For 25 years after that, I used this thing anytime I needed to take a console anywhere, but not anymore because it started to deteriorate. It's gotten sticky and it stinks for some reason. Oh. Oof. The games I bought also came in their rental cases. When you rented a game, they came in these clamshell cases, just like VHS movies did. And most rental stores would have a sticker with condensed instructions for each game stuck inside the case. And they don't come open easy. Especially not after all these years. Oh, there's the... Polar Bear's information stuck to the outside. Ah, oh, I got one. Okay. 
yeah, Altered Beast. It just tells you basically what you need to know to play the game. A tiny synopsis at the top of what the plot is, if there is one. They didn't rent out the original manuals, although some mom and pop video stores would rent out games with a photocopy of the manual. As the years went by, some really great exclusives were released on the Genesis. Apart from obvious standouts like Sonic the Hedgehog, there were great titles like Shining Force 1 and 2, which were brilliant turn-based strategy games, and Landstalker, which was a sort of isometric Zelda-inspired adventure game. There were amazing games like Phantasy Star 4. There were also terrible games like Phantasy Star 3. Don't get me started on Phantasy Star 3. Anyway, speaking of Phantasy Star 4, that brings up a problem that came with renting cartridge-based games. If you didn't finish the game by the time you had to return it, too bad. Your saved game was stored on the cartridge, and the next guy who rented it was just gonna mercilessly wipe it out. As games got longer and more complex, this became a real issue. I remember I'd already kept Shining Force 2 for a couple of weeks, so the rental fees were starting to add up. I didn't want to turn a game back in unfinished because I'd put so many hours in it, so I asked a guy I knew who worked at Hastings, the store where I had rented it, what the replacement fee for the game would be if I had lost it. When he told me the price, I said I had in fact lost it and I paid the fee. Now, after I'd rented Phantasy Star 4 for a few weeks, I thought about just buying it at Walmart, but the cartridge had so much RAM in it that it was really expensive, something like 80 bucks. Plus, I'd have to start over again. So again, I went to Hastings and asked them what the replacement fee was, and they said $60. So I said, okay, then it looks like I lost it. And at that point, the employee just looked me in the eye and said, don't do this again. So I didn't. As you can see from my copy of Phantasy Star 4, it still has the Hastings rental sticker on it. Then, in 1993, just after I'd graduated from high school for my 18th birthday, my parents gave me a Sega CD system. It had been out for about six months at that point. Now, I'd already owned a Turbo Duo for quite a while, so the CD format wasn't new to me, but like I said, I'm saving the Turbo stuff for another video. In case you don't know, the Sega CD wasn't a standalone system. It was an add-on for the Genesis. Beyond just the CD drive, it also added some audio and graphics capabilities to the original system. There were some great games for the Sega CD. Not many, but a few. There were a lot of full motion video games like Mad Dog McCree, Cobra Command, Time Gal, Sewer Shark, Night Trap, and so on. By and large, these games are awful. Now, the only reason these games existed was just by virtue of the fact that the CD format allowed for the kind of storage capacity that these kinds of games required. People were making these games now because they just weren't possible before. The only problem was that the console specs weren't good enough to show video at a decent quality. So developers were basically drunk with power and did some things that should never have been done. Uh, with most of the Sega CD FMV games, the video didn't even fill the screen, and the color depth was so low that they looked like poorly animated GIFs. So you won't see any full motion video games listed among the greats for the Sega CD format. The truly great CD games utilize the CD format simply to have recorded music and voiceover in games, as well as higher quality and quantity pixel art cutscenes. And that's where the system shined. Games like Lunar, The Silver Star, Lunar Eternal Blue, Snatcher, Shining Force CD, They, Popful Mail, and Sonic CD were great. But unfortunately, that's not just a list of good games. That's pretty much the complete list of must-have games for the system. Oh, there was a version of Out of This World for Sega CD that included a sequel called Heart of the Alien on the disc. This is the only version of that sequel in existence, and it provides closure to the Out of This World story, which ended in a cliffhanger if you've played it. It's stupidly difficult and frustrating, especially at first, but I for one thought that it was worth it and really enjoyed it in the long run. So at about that same time, because I remember I was just starting college, a unique thing came onto the scene for the Sega Genesis, the Sega Channel. The Sega Channel was a subscription-based service through your local cable company, it involved plugging this special modem into the cartridge slot on the Genesis, which let me download certain games through a menu system each month. This let me play games for the cost of my subscription, which I think was about 10 bucks a month, rather than having to rent them. And there were occasionally games that had only been released in Japan that you could play on it, such as Mega Man Wily Wars. It was an interesting idea, but it, it didn't work all that well. 
The download speeds were ridiculously slow. We're talking half an hour or more for some games. And you could only have one game downloaded at a time. But it was a novelty, and I felt really cool for having it. And it was way ahead of its time. So there's an overview of my experience with the Sega Genesis. Most of the time, I didn't love it as much as I had loved my NES, but there were some real standout games that did blow me away. Once the Super Nintendo came out, any game that was released on both consoles was inarguably, audibly, and graphically inferior on the Genesis. But the most important thing to me about the Sega Genesis was that Nintendo really needed competition to break up its monopoly on the US video game market. Sega did that. So I don't care if you were Team Mario or Team Sonic, the video game industry is better off today because of their rivalry. Thanks for watching.